So what you're seeing today and what you're participating in today is a very sort of quick and dirty uh, hybrid model of these two strategies. And either strategy in and of itself, as you all know, is an effective way to approach primary sources with students. And you certainly don't have to combine the two strategies at all, but we think that there is some value in trying to do that. And I think there's also a few very different ways that you could combine them depending on what your objectives are. So we're gonna try one right now. Oh, and yes, this is my reminder that it is all a work in progress. So um, if it doesn't work for you or if there are thing, you know, suggestions you have, we're very receptive to that. Next slide. Okay, so as, as you, I think the most of you know, there are four rules for producing questions. That's how the QFT starts. And I think you probably are familiar with them. So I will be brief. You're gonna ask as many questions as you can. You're not gonna stop to answer, judge, or discuss. You're gonna write down every question exactly as stated. And in this case, I'd just like you to write it down exactly as it comes to mind. And you're gonna be using the chat box. So the chat box is gonna get um, a little bit messy. I think it'll be fine, but just exactly as that question comes to mind, pop it in the chat box, write it down, and you'll hear me reading them out loud. And then change any statements into questions. So something that comes to mind in as a statement, try to transform it. Okay, all right, so we're all following the four rules. So your question focus, and in a second, Katie's gonna zoom in on it, and for now, just I just want you to look at it. So don't ask any questions yet. Just look at the question focus. It's a primary source image. And we've given you um, a part of a caption, which is open air class, public school number 51, Manhattan, New York City, rest hour. So just look for a few more seconds. Okay, so go ahead, put your questions in the chat box. Okay, so I see what age are the students? When was the photo taken? How's our definition of open classrooms changed? Why is the class open air? Why are the windows open? How old are the students? Why are the kids so young and thin looking? How did this impact student health and welfare? What year is this? Is this the pandemic of 1918? What's on the board? What year is this? Are they sick? Is this a tuberculosis hospital? Why are the windows open? What's the purpose of an open air class? Was this because of no child labor standards? Where is this located? Why was it open air? Spanish flu, why are these kids speaking, uh, sleeping? And uh, 40 more questions that I didn't <laughs> read out loud. So let's pause with, the, pause with the questions for just one minute. It's okay if you can drop a few more in there, but I wanna give everybody a chance to scroll through and, and read what's been written. And also Katie and I are gonna give you just a little bit more context. And then we'd like you to add any new questions that come to mind. Okay, go ahead, Katie. So the new context is open air schools were common in some cities as a response to an outbreak of tuberculosis in 1904 to 1905. So just a couple more minutes, new questions that you have. I see, are the children sick? Where are the deaths? What are the students' socioeconomic status? Are they required to sleep? Are they quarantined? How did the open air class affect public school 51? Is this a group home? How old, boys and girls? Where are the adults? Do these kids have tuberculosis? Did this strategy help? How long did schools practice this? Do they sleep there overnight? How serious was the tuberculosis outbreak? How successful was this strategy? How does this help prevent transmission? Why was there a rest area? Did these children have tuberculosis? Why was it preferred that they be in school? What about their families? Which cities? Where's the teacher? Is it a segregated school? 
did our schools get the idea of opening our windows in school during COVID-19 from this? Mm-hmm. Was this a requirement? How long did this strategy last for? Did all schools operate like this? Which cities? Did this happen in all schools? How is this procedure helping the outbreak? What happened in the winter? Why are the kids so close together? What were the conceptions of health and wellness? And what achieves this during this time? What proportion of time was rest time? Why are the kids still so close together? Thank you all so much. Was this successful? What was the standard for care? Thank you, thank you all. So um, we're gonna ask you now, read through the questions. I know that was a lot of, (laughs) there's a lot of questions and it's hard to read the chat box as quickly as the questions are coming up. So you heard me read some of them, but now take a look, read through yourself. And what I'd like you to do is add just one new question. And that could be a new question that was inspired by something that you heard someone else ask or you saw someone else ask, or it could be an adaptation of an existing question. Those of you who know the QFT know that we might do more work with closed and open-ended questions at this point if you want to. So just read the questions for about a minute and then decide and add your one new question. Maybe you could sneak two new questions in if you really want to. Okay, so I see lots of new questions in here. I'm just gonna read the ones from uh, 4.12, 4 o'clock. How was this procedure's effectiveness measured and by whom? In what ways were there different responses um, for children versus adults? What's the gender? What do children do the rest of the school day? Was this voluntary? Did this practice produce positive results? What role did the school play in housing these children? How did this practice affect more modern practices with outbreaks of illness? Was this procedure a preventative measure or reactionary? What was the thinking at that time about tuberculosis transmission? What lessons have we learned about the role of schools in public health that are being addressed today? Why was this strategy thought to be effective in preventing tuberculosis? How did daily infection rate change after implementation of open air classrooms? If the school was segregated, were schools for other groups of kids experiencing the same thing? Who took this photo? What data was obtained from this response? What did scientists learn from this practice about how to handle outbreaks? How is the city providing the children with an adequate educational learning experience? So, <laughs> There are there are 20 to 30 more messages and please forgive me if I missed your question. So I'm going to ask you to do something really hard here. <laughs> and from all of the questions that you just generated, um, we're trying to narrow it down to a few priorities. So you can put in the chat box um, something, you know, that you feel it's pretty important that you'd like to discuss or you could unmute and you could tell us if there's a question that you you feel like, let's really discuss this question. Is anyone I, like, I don't know if I can be heard. Oh, there, like, yes, Jill, go <laughs> ahead. Somebody had to, to bite the bullet. Um, <laughs> how did this practice affect more modern practices with outbreaks of illnesses? Mm-hmm. Um, Thank you, Jill. Did you wanna say more, Jill? No, I think that 
because if, if I'm thinking about the QFT process as the lead in for what happens, that's what gives relevancy. Mm -hmm. So if I was a kid, that's what would grab my attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is Heidi. Can I say something to yeah, go for it, Heidi? So my <laughs> my three questions. Um, the two are not questions that I would have asked had you not provided the information about the tuberculosis and the date. Um, because if, if those had not been available, I would have said who, I would have still said who took the photo, but I would have said, um, you know, what time period was this or something like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Heidi. Other this priorities. Is this is Karen, and I like Jill's, the question that Jill had, but I also really liked the question that someone had about the practices um, observed in this, the photo impacting our practices with COVID-19, mm. um, bringing it relevant to today. And I had not thought to ask that question, so kudos to whoever did. That was mm. good. Thank you, Karen. Other, other priority questions? Hi, I'm Madeline. Hi, so Madeline. I like the question of how effective was this? Did this, 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 this process um, increase contamination or decrease it? Mm. Thank you. Hi, my name is Linda Epps. My question is, is this a test group of students or is this the standard that was taking place in schools? Mm. Thank you, Linda. Is this a test group or is this the standard? Thank you. I see we've got some in the chat box too. What are schools responsibilities balancing students' health and learning? And I saw Anne put in um, Karen's questions, what other practices were used to treat or prevent tuberculosis? Gabrielle, was this, a, was this a procedure a preventative measure or reactionary? And Jason's, how did the daily infections rate change after implementation? I kind of like the idea of, um, trying to figure out, you know, whose idea this was, where did it come from? Was it, you know, data-based? I mean, did they have um, any kind of study that showed this might be effective or not? Mm. Thank you, Diane. This is Jason, and I'm thinking about the question about it being either reactionary or proactive, and um, it makes me think about uh, when these sorts of practices might have begun as well. Um, you know, this is 1904, 1905. Were there other times in history where we were trying to do open air responses to um, pandemics? I'm gonna try to open this up a little bit. So Katie, can you go, yeah, to the next slide, thank you. And we might need to actually go back to the original Q focus. And I think that, you know, I'd like us to take a few, a few guesses and just think, drill down into this photo a, a little bit more. Um, a lot of the priority questions we could think next about, you know, what other information that we would need. But before we move into that sort of like expanding and collecting other information, I'd like us to think just about this photo a little bit more. Um, so I particularly like, let's start with just what are you seeing here? What were some of the details that were striking to you about this image? And you can go ahead and put that in the chat box. Just any, like what are the really striking details to you? Yeah, I see age of the children, the deck chairs, the children seem small, they all have hats, they're sleeping, writing on the blackboard, how bundled up the kids are. I'm struck by the standardization. 
are the children the, the children are wearing hats yeah yeah and i i'm i'm sort of interested this question um one of the priority questions that you all mentioned was was this procedure a preventative measure or was it a reaction i think um and kind of any guesses about that like what do you what do you what do you think is going on here is it a procedure or <laughs> is, it a pre is it a reaction or is it a preventative And I see a new question here, Linda. Are they staged for this picture? I was thinking it could be some type of an image or publicity to encourage kids to come back to school or what takes place in the school. It looks, just looks too uniformity. It looks mm. too uniform, or ordered and structured. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Linda. Yeah, the the um, detail about it being very structured, it seems like there's this is some there's something official. We're trying to draw students back to school. Other, I see Jason said my my spider senses tell me they're trying to fight a tuberculosis act, um, outbreak. Yeah, I don't know. I I think the an important piece to it is the year and the fact that they're children and children were not viewed the same way then as we do now. I think maybe we're applying 2021 standards on children in a way that didn't exist in 1904 and 1905 in terms of value, worth, um, contribution to society. Mm -hmm. Jill, are you, are you thinking about sort of the uniformity like the, what details to you feel like we shouldn't read, we shouldn't, we shouldn't apply too much modern standards to it? Um, just the time period. I mean, you're talking about, um, you know, child labor is rampant. Mm. Uh, immigration is rampant. You have, a high, you have a high level mm. of kids being orphans. Mm. There you go. I just put it in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, is this propaganda or is it just like, I don't know, but I think, I think we just have to be very, I would tell my students to be very careful that your standard of what you think is going on with kids, you're talking about uh, a little more than a century ago where children weren't valued the same way mm. or viewed the same way. Mm. Thank you, Jill. Um, I'm kind of curious about if there's anything, so we, we named some of the things that you saw and all of those observations really fed into the questions that you asked. Is there anything that you don't see? Adults. Like, I see that the desks, the desks are not there. Are there no adults. Section? No adults. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I don't see any other treatment uh, tools or or implements like you know there's no tables there's no medicine there's no uh, and nothing else for treatment mm -hmm. thank you Shelley yeah and I see we have a new question what was the purpose of taking this photo is this used for medical purposes I want to um, drill down a little bit there were questions a lot of questions i saw about the cities that this was we know that this is in new york city a lot of you mentioned you know which cities or why cities any any thoughts about that like what are your inferences about what is this a standard uh, is this standard procedure or were these um, which cities, all cities, just a few cities, any guesses? I, I see we've, Heidi's putting overcrowded housing in the cities leading to outbreaks. Yeah, was tuberculosis higher in the cities? Very populated cities, densely populated. And then in cities, you have tenements and you have, at that time, you had ghettos where people live, multiple families within one area. Mm, thank you. And I see factory workers. Yeah, so lots of, 
we're, I'm lucky you all have such background knowledge on this. Okay, so I'm gonna, so thank you so much. I, are there any other sort of final like parting thoughts about this image? And then we're gonna show you just a couple um, more images. So I see cities equal progressive, equal trying out new techniques, question mark. There are lots of new questions that are that now came up just from a really short discussion that we had. Um, so I I want to know like what if the burning questions changed at all, and what would you do next? Like what if you wanted to go find those answers to some of your burning questions? What would you do next? And you can put that in the chat box or feel free to unmute. And again, some of the priority questions that um, you mentioned were, how does this practice affect more modern practices? Um, how, do they, how does it affect the response to COVID-19? How effective was this? Was this a test group or the standard? Um, where did this come, where did this idea come from? When, these sorts of when were these sorts of practices begun? We do have some comments in the chat box. Um, Jason saying, I'd like to look into the evolution of outbreak response in a historical sense. Some further research about the time period, what did school look like? Research the picture by the info given. Okay, so thank you all for saying that. <laughs> As it turns out, uh, Katie and I were sort of stumbled across this image and we did some, we had a very similar process that all of us just had. So Katie, do you wanna share some of the digging that we did next? Sure. So these are some other images of school from that time. Uh, Sarah and I were actually looking for schooling, you know, in the past. We were just interested in seeing what classrooms of the past looked like and that's, and then we happened upon this image and, and um, it brought us to more. There's, turns out there's a lot at the Library of Congress about open air schools. So here's one other image of an open air school in Chicago. And you can see all the kids are wearing um, big, big winter coats and mittens. And this one's between 1900 and 1915. Um, this is just another classroom from 1899, uh, Washington, DC. This one is, um, little kids sitting around a table, uh, Sacramento, California. And again, this was between 1900 and 1920, but thought it was interesting that it looked very different from the, the previous. Um, and then this one says it's a summer open air school and it's all boys working in a manual training, training class. This was from 1917. And then finally, this one is from the Tuskegee Institute, 1906, um, a mathematics class. Other questions that are coming up for you as you're seeing this, and at, as things come up, feel free to pop them in the chat box again. Maybe you can, can you cycle through them one more time, Katie? Yes. A couple more times. <laughs> So one, one thing we found out, we didn't even know the open air schools. Um, I had never heard of them. Katie had never heard of them. We didn't know that that was a search term we should even use. <laughs> um, so we got that from the bibliographic information on the Library of Congress. And we also found out that um, open air schools became more prevalent in cities sort of sort of slowly, like um, 1910, 1915, 1920. And the, they started in Germany and it was a, a German reaction to tuberculosis that slowly sort of filtered over to the US. And we did, we liked um, sort of the, the imagery of students working together versus the students sitting and the teacher at the front of the room and thought that was very interesting. And I actually hadn't thought about not having a teacher that there is there are no adults at all in the original primary source image we gave you, which is really, I just hadn't thought of it. <laughs> 
I also want to point out, this is my own personal project. And I would really, I would buy someone a steak dinner if they can figure out what it is. I'm convinced that in the background of these, a couple of these images, the same picture is on the wall. Can you, can you sort of point at it, Katie, with your cursor, the, I think, the, yeah, that one. Do you see this image in the back hanging on the wall? Okay, and then go to the Sacramento one. Sarah? Yes. I think it, I think my grandmother had this in her house. <laughs> Heidi. <laughs> I think Kat, Kat, it's like Mary and Jesus, I think. That's what I figured. And it, too. And it, it's like a, from a Renaissance painting, but um, but I think that uh, I think it's used to signify like, you know, um, the value of children, sort of. Um, Mary and the mother mother thing, I think. I've, okay, I've seen that. I've, I've heard that somewhere else. Okay, I, so Heidi, you gotta could, see if those, you can get a hold of this. <laughs> for could me. those classrooms be from parochial schools? Oh, great question. Thank, uh, thank you. That's what I said in my in the chat. I said at first I thought it was Catholic schools because I kept seeing that picture, mm. but but I think that it it might have been used as like a it's a sim. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe maybe it's all Catholic schools. Mm. Oh, that's so interesting. Uh, Katie, can we go to Tuskegee one more time? And they, so I was looking, you know, in my obsession with this image, this photo, a painting, there is a painting on the back there that looks sort of similar, like, but it's not the same one. And there are two children, I think, in it. Mm. it and then there looks like maybe there's a, a president or something in the other one. Grover Cleveland. <laughs> Is it Grover Cleveland? I don't know why that hmm. name just jumped to my head. I don't know if it's true. I just made okay. that. Okay, we need to get to the bottom of all these background then, details. And then these, these, the other photo, which is two figures in a landscape possibly doing work. Hmm. Yeah, it's really that, very that fascinating. Me in terms of like the purpose of education, what do we show students within the classroom about what is outside the classroom? Mm. Mm. Thank you. The picture mm -hmm. of uh, the presidential looking guy, that's Grant. Ah. So it's interesting that Grant is hanging, especially in 1906, is hanging in a a Tuskegee Institute classroom. I think, I think we kind of know why. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Kim. Yeah. Yeah, and there's another question, a few more questions in the chat box. When did everyone put George Washington photos up? And um, the, uh, the image gives the message of caring love linked with education, question mark. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, there's a lot, there's a lot here. I have a lot of questions that I didn't have. <laughs> uh, Alicia, um, this working picture reminds me of my father-in-law, who is 94, and he told me he embroidered handkerchief, handkerchiefs at school. So I wonder what's, um, that's what the building in school was about. Oh, what I meant to say was I wonder if that's maybe what the kids in the school were doing because he mm. told me that they would the teacher would leave and then come back in the afternoon and they were expected to be done with a certain amount of uh, work in the classroom mm. Mm. thank you and that comes from Puerto Rico mm. yeah no that's great it meant well it makes me want to go find see what images comparable images from Puerto Rico we could find. <laughs> Probably a lot. <laughs> um, okay, so let's, can we, can you move on? Good. So I just want to do, I know we, we said this would be a short webinar, um, so we're going to try to wrap up relatively soon. So I'd, I'm just curious, you know, what did you learn 
um, maybe a, like a question that you're gonna walk away with. And um, how do you connect this to your work in education more broadly? So I'll give you a minute if you can put that in the chat box, but you can feel free to unmute too. I see this, this is, is this summer so different, that different? Yeah, Shuli learned about the open air school. The techniques can be blended together. Continue something, to require teachers. Oh, go ahead, Alicia. Um, something that I learned about it that's interesting is we're always um, told to ask the student. I teach third grade. Um, we're always um, told to have um, ask the students questions and don't give them the answers. But what I like about this component of it is that it wasn't just asking in the questions. We were taking everyone else's questions and forming new ideas. And I think that helped me to not only look just at the picture or the time period, but it just helped me to analyze other things that I wouldn't have thought of. And I think once I think about it a little bit more, my questioning uh, will be better um, in, uh, in the future. So I think that doing this type of thing would also give the students benefit because they're building off of the questions already asked. Mm, mm, thank you. Um, to add to what Alicia is uh, just said, like, yeah, so thinking about how we can uh, blend either QFT or the primary source analysis and thinking about how we can start with student questions, um, have rich discussions about that, and then be uh, thoughtful about how we're strategically um, helping kids in how they tuned in to the content so that they can then leverage that possibility to find out and, you know, start that inquiry learning sort of approach to um, knowledge creation. Mm, thank you, Jason. For me, I learned that the this whole concept of wonder came into play too, because you were wondering a lot of different things. And so that wonder can lead to exploration, to inquiry, into other forms of learning. Mm, thank you, Linda. So I just wanted to try to make visible <laughs> the way I sequenced things today. And again, this is the part where um, really, if I understand if um, you have to run, and I really appreciate that you spent this much time with us, but I'd really welcome any thoughts you have about like how the sequence worked or, um, it, you know, what, what can even, what can be gained from pairing these two processes together? I think um, some of you mentioned that in your reflection already, but just other thoughts about the sequence. We did do a little bit, we gave you uh, the Q focus in two parts. I think you'll probably have noticed that, that we layered in a caption. So we didn't, we, we purposely withheld a little bit of information. And we also didn't give you a long caption. You know, we gave you really like one sentence of information. Um, and then I also want to draw your attention here. You know, number five is where we had more of a discussion where we opened up to statements and inferences and observations. And then um, I invited you to keep adding questions all the way through steps five, six, and seven. So there were a lot of questions that came up, you know, uh, five minutes ago that we certainly didn't have at the beginning of the webinar that came out of the conversation and the discussion or came out of seeing additional primary sources. So that was the goal. <laughs> but I, I'm very curious for any of you that are willing to stay if you have feedback for us and or thoughts about how it fits together. Can you show us the TPS the other slide too for a second. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've sure. never seen that. So primary yeah. source analysis tool. Okay. 
Yeah, and this is a this is a tool that um, you would see pretty frequently with the Teaching with Primary Sources program out of the Library of Congress, and um, you know the idea. I've seen this tool facilitated in a linear way, like um, isolating observations, isolating reflections, and then isolating questions, mm -hmm. and and questions come last. <laughs> <laughs> which, oh, which yeah right um but i i think the intention behind this tool is actually that thinking is much more fluid that you you should students should be able to observe reflect and question as a circular process or as an iterative process um and this tool becomes more of a mechanism for metacognition so that students can recognize different types of thinking that they've done Sarah, this is Karen. Mm, hi, Karen. Um, I, I work at a district office and I actually um, coach social studies teachers. Mm. And the teachers in our district are very familiar with the primary source analysis tool. Mm. I actually went to the Library of Congress Institute, Summer Institute about 10 years ago. So I really promote the use of it, mm. but I really loved blending it mm. with the questioning process because um, as you have said, the questions are kind of uncomfortable coming at the end mm -hmm. of this tool. And I have seen students just kind of put something in that square because they feel like if they leave it blank, the teacher won't accept their work mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and mm -hmm. not because they're really questioning. And the way that the um, QFT process played out we were talking about what we observed and we were inferring with what we observed and we were asking questions, like you said, all at the same time. And the one thing that I appreciated that I had not really done in practice is the way you kept asking us to ask more questions. That's, um, I really appreciate that part of it because our questions got better as we went along. So thank you for modeling this. I'm excited to, uh, to work with my teachers on this. Oh, thank you so much, Karen. Mm -hmm. I can add as well, I particularly like uh, the, uh, the inclusion of the observe and infer, you know, like the power of a protocol, uh, like a QFT, is that it allows both open endedness while getting you there. Um, but the nature of an inquiry is both like you're talking about, it's recursive and reflexive, you kind of go back and forth in terms of questioning, observing, inferring, and then more questioning. And that's what we want to foster through this process. So adding that into the QFT just helps kind of intentionalize it. And I look forward to figuring out and playing with it and to figure out how to best use it to you know get all of those questions out <laughs> have kids thinking deeply about what they're seeing and then getting them fired up to go find things out. Mm, mm, thank you. Thanks, Jason. I like the combination of the two because it forces number one, the teacher to take a deep dive into the questioning protocol. And it also allows the, the students to identify what else do I wonder about and think about and want to learn about this topic or concept. So it takes it even beyond what even the classroom teacher may even introduce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Linda. Well, I I really I mean I really appreciate all of you being here. I will, Karen. Um, I will share the PowerPoint slides. We'll post that where you registered for the webinar. Um, I think Katie, you can even email that out, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. And I, I really welcome any other, you know, anyone who wants to continue talking about this or thinking about this with us, please get in touch because we, there's a lot more to learn. Um, you know, and I think like the QFT, it, it's meant to be customized. So Heidi, I, I totally hear what you're saying that um, maybe you do need to do open and closed in a fuller way you know, potentially that, and there are things lost when you do that in a more loose way. So there are choices that you make as a facilitator and we, Katie and I are up here guessing <laughs> at 
So we really appreciate um, if you're if you're interested in partnering with us and being a part of this work with the library, please, please email because I think there this is the beginning really of the work and um, there's a lot of potential here. There, it just, both of these tools are so synergistic. It's just a matter of, you know, how the pieces fit together and for what purpose, for what objective. <laughs>